For this part of the journey, through the darkest layers of our beloved childhood game, it may help to see through the lens of a child's eyes. If you first picked up the game when you were younger, then use those memories and nostalgia as the anchor for your perspective. Imagine you're sitting on a carpet in front of an old CRT screen, your new Nintendo 64 jacked into the back, smooth plastic controller in the palm of your hands. You blow in the bottom of the cartridge, as one does of course, and slot it into the console before powering it on. The game words to life. The bright colorful logo pops up on the screen with a twinkle. You hear those seminal words. It's a me, Mario. And you know you're in for an evening of discovery and challenge and fun. If you didn't play Mario 64 back then, or just never got around to trying it, then think about how you felt playing your favorite game of all time as a kid and use that as your guide. If you haven't seen parts 1 or 2 of the Mario 64 Iceberg Explained yet, then you should probably start there. The video playlist should be linked in the top corner of this video now. If you have seen the previous chapters and you're ready to explore the third layer of the iceberg, then strap in as we take Bowser's sub down yet one more level into the unknown. Of course, as usual, Mario starts in front of the castle. Kid you runs up the slight slope between you and the castle instead of taking the path all the way around. You bound across the bridge to go inside. Exploring a bit, you chase the big boo at the end of the back hallway and take the door into the castle courtyard. When you exit from the castle's back door, however, you turn around and pause to look at it. You've never really looked at it before, mostly because you spend all of your time actually inside the castle. This time, though, you notice the frame of the door is not really the standard frame, but rather a thick border of bricks that doesn't quite match the wall around it. You reason to yourself, it probably means Bowser smashed through this very door right here, and the Toads had to rebuild it back up with new bricks after he took over. You head back in the castle and straight into the main lobby foyer. You remember something a friend told you at the playground at recess at school earlier that day. They said they'd managed to get through that painting of Peach that turns into Bowser at the end of the hall behind the first star door. You reason it's not entirely impossible because you've always thought there had to be some way to get in that painting. If only you could just get past that invisible barrier. Try and try as you might, you just can't surmount that obstacle. You long jump, double jump, triple jump. Heck, you even try the triple jump and dive. But every time Mario just bonks his head on the barrier and falls into Dark World. Oh well, you tell yourself. Maybe your friend just knew something you didn't. You'll figure it out someday. What did they say was behind that painting, anyways? You think about your conversation about the Bowser painting. You press your friend on it at lunchtime at school, asking things like, How did you do it? And where does the Bowser painting even lead to? Naturally, your friend didn't want to give away all of their secrets, but they did lean in real close and whisper, You want to know where it goes? You nod your head swiftly, eager for any new info about the game. It goes to the Bowser room, your friend says. The gray brick room, completely empty, except for a platform and a window. What's out the window, you ask? Hooked on their every word. All you see out the window, they say, is Bowser, staring in at you. You take that in, a bit spooked at the idea of Bowser just eyeballing you on the stage, but absolutely dying to see it for yourself. The reality of the Bowser room is that it was a tiny joke uh, made by one of the gamers on the YouTube channel Oni Plays, and it ballooned out of control into a whole meme. The meme originates from the image that was made to accompany this joke, which you can see here now. Yeah, it's not particularly impressive, and it definitely wasn't real. Something that was real, though, is the fact that toads were literally turned into bricks by Bowser's power in Super Mario Bros. Don't worry though, the breakable bricks were not the toads, rather just the power of bricks. Supposedly. So it's no surprise that some people have theorized that in Super Mario 64, Bowser has once again turned the toads into bricks in the castle. Heck, Toad even tells Mario to his face that they and the princess are all trapped inside the castle walls. Once again, players may be reading too much into some simple dialogue, but it can be construed as meaning that they are literally inside the castle's walls. After all, don't some toads have 
Power Stars ready to hand over to help Mario in his quest to defeat Bowser, just like those special brick blocks from Super Mario Bros. This all ties in with the idea of toad projection, and Peach being behind the stained glass window at the front of the castle the entire time. Since toads appear more like apparitions, fading as you move away, much like the boos fade away as you approach them from the front, those who believe that toad is literally trapped in the walls theorize that the toads you interact with are just projections, like a physical version of an astral projection or something. To add to all that, Peach, who Toad claims is also trapped within the walls with them, also projects out from the stained glass window when Bowser is fully defeated, implying that she, too, was literally inside the walls the whole time. So you're back at your N64 again. After you failed to conquer the Bowser painting that your friend swore could be entered, you still wanted to discover some new secret in the game. You figure you'll go to one of the weirder levels, Hazy Maze Cave. HMC, as it's called, has all the hallmarks of a spooky level. Dark pits leading to a black abyss. Enemies like giant eyes, bats, and bugs. Plenty of spots to drown in water or burn up in fire. The best thing is that it's designed like a maze, meaning you never really knew if there was some secret path hidden in there, perhaps some turn you never thought to take that would unlock an entirely new sub-area. You don't find anything but the usual stuff there, and after trudging through to the hidden cave that hosts the metal cap switch and finding nothing of note, as usual, you let the running rapid sweep you away and out the end of the cave. Except instead of simply dying and coming out of the HMC painting, which you just now realize is more of a hole full of liquid, then a painting, you fall down the waterfall into the castle moat. Wait a minute, Hazy Maze Cave the giant drainage pipe for the castle? Indeed, there's plenty of evidence to support this. While calling it a septic system may be a bit too specific, HMC is indeed basically the sewers of Peach's castle. The entrance is one of the lowest spots in the basement, which is a bit flooded despite the other levels in there being based on lava and sand, and all that water seems to drain right through HMC and out into the castle's moat and lakes. While this has spawned some rather hilarious theories, such as the rolling rock boulder supposedly being reimagined as balls of waste, as you might say, I haven't heard anyone mention how Dory spends all her time waiting around in sewage water. Poor Dory. Speaking of the metal cap, did you know that the metal Mario texture has an entire history behind it? Even if you know a part of it, the whole story is actually hard to piece together due to all the time that has passed, as well as all the rumors that have spread on the internet like a game of telephone or grapevine. So for those who have never seen it before, here in all of its grandeur is the original image used for Metal Mario's texture. Okay, okay, well it's not all that grand, I give you that, but that's just the low resolution version that was used to save space and memory for the game. Here's the original resolution image that Nintendo ended up editing down. Yeah, that's some flowers, alright. Uh, power flowers, you might say. It all comes full circle, baby. That's pretty neat, but uh, notice I haven't said it's Nintendo's image yet. Because, well, it wasn't. For a long time, nobody knew the origins of the metal texture that's used for Metal Mario, as it goes with many textures in these older games. But it turns out... Somebody found one on an old computer by a now defunct company called Silicon Graphics, known by their acronym of SGI. Remember that name, Silicon Graphics. It's going to come up again, in a big way. For now though, let us return to our story where we left off, just having left HMC, making our way back up and into the castle. Okay. So, you know you can enter Dire Dire Docks through a rippling painting made of water which stands at the end of a hallway, the access to which is locked behind a star door that requires the power of 30 stars, or a well-placed yellow bunny rabbit if you know what you're doing. Except this time, as you open the star door, you find you can't get to that painting, somewhat because of the fact that between you and the end of the hallway is a massive Wario head floating menacingly in the shadows and cackling, taunting you forward, but mostly because you can't even bring yourself to move your joystick one way or the other. In fact, you can't even move your thumbs at all. Your eyes are simply glued to the screen. Your pulse is beating in your ears like a drum. Something is terribly wrong. So much so that your body refuses to budge an inch. That is, until the Wario head chomps at the air and slowly begins to move towards you. Suddenly, your focus sharpens, and your hands respond to your command. 
You pull a clean pivot 180 degrees and book it back towards the start door. Wario's monstrous head twisting and writhing hot on your heels, eyes glowing and spinning demonically. You want fun? Wario well, will show you fun! And heavy, funky, crazy music is all you can hear as, with not even a single moment left to spare, you slip through the star door and it shuts behind you slowly, right in Wario's big, ugly face. You're safe now. Everything is back to normal. The castle music plays just as you would expect it to, but it's a bit of a pain to your ears. You have a grueling headache and you're still overwhelmingly anxious. What in the world was that? You have to ask yourself, was that even real? There are a few mysteries in Super Mario 64 that can claim to be as infamous or as unnerving as the dreaded Wario apparition. Said to originate either from the personalization AI's desire to create fresh new content from existing game assets, or from players' unconscious desires and wishes for Wario to make an appearance in the game, the anomaly is often recounted the same. The player enters the hallway to Dire Dire Docks only to find a giant Wario head apparition floating in front of the painting. It slowly starts approaching, gaining speed, becoming crazier, shouting, and laughing at the player. After escaping, the player feels sick or nauseous. Many of the tales surrounding the Wario apparition say that players can even fall into a comatose state from some sort of shock. Perhaps a shock delivered by seeing something one knows to be impossible with their own eyes. So take that all with a bit of a grain of salt. This anomaly gained popularity very early on in the timeline of Super Mario 64 as a still of the Wario operation was verifiably taken from an E3 1996 panel where Nintendo presented the Nintendo 64, becoming one of the game's earliest memes and cementing in Super Mario history a Super Mario mystery. Let's take a moment to talk about the mirror room again. Yeah, that room really fascinated people. And it makes another appearance, here, near the bottom of the list. It's tough to pinpoint which door exactly is referred to as the forbidden door, but it could be the door in the reflection of the mirror room, which Luigi can access with the help of a power flower in Super Mario 64 DS. Or it could be another door alleged to appear in some personalized copies of the game that leads goodness knows where. Your guess is as good as mine on that one. According to Toad, the mirror room is also home to an ally with info, but it's hard to discern who exactly that ally is and what info they have. Could it be the hint in the reflection that a painting exists which you just can't see? It's hard to say because even though Wario can be unlocked through a stage found in the mirror room, Toad even tells Wario that there's an ally with info back inside. Hmm. After the Wario apparition, you're shaken to your core. You'd finally found one of those secrets you'd been looking for. But was it worth it? You don't dare touch your N64 for days. At school later that week, your friends are talking about games, and once again Mario comes up. You timidly offer up that you saw Wario before you even think about it. And then you realize, are they going to think you're crazy? But surprisingly, they all slowly start to nod their heads, one after the other. And your friend that made it to the Bowser painting says, Oh yeah, me too. Really cool they added the Wario. Uh, I always knew they, they would. You nod too, realizing you were probably just overreacting to something a bit creepy. And it had always been in the game anyways. Your friends didn't seem to think much about it, so neither did you. And soon enough, you picked the controller back up again. During one of your epic struggles against the King Koopa, Bowser himself, you notice that the exploding mines which surround the platform of the fight rest on a yellowish ball of some sort. In fact, these yellowed spheres remind you of something you've seen before. Somewhere else in this very game. Oh yeah, Wiggler's body is made up of these very same spheres. And then you realize the cold hard truth. Bowser's boss arenas are lined with the body parts of Wiggler's. Wow, you think to yourself. That's rough. While we're on the topic of the parts of Mario 64 lore that could be considered almost body horror, let's talk about the elusive brain diagram. Supposedly, there is an unused image file in the game of an actual brain. It's pretty low resolution, and it's even been alleged that it was meant to be the image used in the painting for Wet Dry World, as if that level really needed anything else to make it more off-putting, am I right? Speaking of WDW... 
It's time to conquer your very least favorite level. Wet Dry World. You have a good number of stars now, but that final star door keeps laughing in your face. You can go in, and you can walk up that final staircase, but you know you'll never make it to the top in this save file if you don't get all those stars. You need more stars, and that means playing the levels you don't really care for. Wet Dry World tops that list. It's always been a slog in your previous playthroughs, even though the strange mechanics initially excited you. As you enter the world, landing on a wooden platform floating in the water, you take a moment to look up at the sky. This little action, an experience you usually find pleasant even in spooky maps like Big Boo's Haunt, is, here in this stage, oddly uncomfortable. You go ahead and play the level, not necessarily having fun, but just trying to grind through the annoying enemies and wonky level layout. You grab the star next to the cannon and jump back in again. This time you open the cannon and shoot over to the other side of the map and swim to the flooded town. You drain the water, finish collecting your red coins, and go to grab your star. However, as you stand in front of the star platform, you turn Mario to look out over the village and you think to yourself, where is everyone in this place? What happened here? You know, something's just not quite right about this game. Especially that wet dry world. You know it's all wrong, but you can't really put your finger on why exactly. Your parents have a computer at home, and once they've gone to bed, you slip into the desk chair and boot it up. you figured out how to connect to the internet yourself, and you're ready to finally get some answers. You'd found something interesting. It was a singular post online, drowned out by a number of other more popular posts on the game. You noticed it in particular because of its title. You're intrigued. Maybe this could shed some light on the development of the game that you weren't privy to before and put to rest your subconscious fears of what was otherwise an excellent video game. You read the post to yourself, word by word. Hi. I work with a major distributor of personal game systems, and I have an old build of Super Mario 64 that I was given before the title was even released in the USA. I know it's old because I was given it by a friend in the business who I thought might be interested in buying it for my collection. It was in a box postmarked the 9th of July 1995, and it had clearly already seen a bit of play. It's nothing like the Mario I know it all. Some things are the same, but everything looks different. You just have to see it to believe it. You open the image links below the text in a hurry. There's only a few, and the quality is horrendous even by the standards of the time, but you can clearly see this is not the same game you've been playing, even if all the characters are right. You had to know more, and so you reply to the post. Did you ever see the castle change while you were playing? It's been a few days, but every night you've checked that post to see if the poster ever responded. And tonight, they do. This is all they have to say. Forget about it. I shouldn't have shared confidential Nintendo assets. I'm sorry. A few minutes later, the post is gone. Simply erased from existence, no trace of it left on the boards. You ponder what this could mean. Were those images fake? How could they even fake that? If they weren't fake, then why did he get so spooked when you asked about it? Miffed about this, and with more questions now than answers, you turn on your N64 even though it's well past your bedtime. You go up the castle to the top floor and stand right in front of the wet dry world painting. Why, oh why, do you make me feel so bad? You ask the painting, knowing you're talking to nobody but yourself. But something replies. You're an adult now. It's been years since you've touched Mario 64. Heck, it had been years since you'd even thought about that old game. You would downloaded an N64 emulator and a Mario 64 ROM, enjoying it for a bit but ultimately finding it to be missing... something. Maybe you reason that without that three-pronged controller at your fingertips and a flickering old TV screen to give it that authentic retro feel, that nostalgia just doesn't hit as hard. Your old friend, Nintendo 64, is collecting dust in a raggedy, ancient old box somewhere on an attic shelf. You decide to dig it out and clean it off, interested to give it another go, for old times sake. 
Once you've got it all plugged into an old TV you also found stashed away in the attic, you blow into that cartridge one more time. And for once, dust actually does come out. But when you boot the game up, immediately it's wrong. The title screen starts Wiccan. Mario's face looks unsettlingly glitchy, cutting around the screen like a bat out of hell. The music is familiar, but disturbingly pitched. You slam down that power button on the console and wait a moment. Uneasy. You press it back up again and the game begins once more. Normal this time. Whew! For a second, you had panicked flashbacks to the stories you used to convince yourself were real when you were a kid. Hank, you'd even fooled yourself into thinking some of them had happened to you. You play through a bit more. None of your original save files remain, except for one file that must have been someone else playing at some point. Maybe a cousin or something. You chose this file to play because why not? It was in slot A anyways. You go up the stairs to the second level, figuring you'll nab a few of these stars from Wet Dry World and push to the final Bowser stage that have remained locked so far. You jump into the painting, and within moments, Mario sticks his landing into the stage. Except this Wet Dry World is nothing like you expected. Actually, it's a lot like you remember. All the textures and enemies are the same, but the layout is totally wrong. Yet it all seems so... familiar. You know this isn't the same level you played as a child, but brief bits of muscle memory and tiny shreds of actual memories get you through a couple of minutes of play before it finally clicks. This was your save file. The last one you ever played before you stepped away for good. This strange new version of Wet Dry World was what drove you to do it too. It was the final straw. You power the game off without so much of the save, wondering if that other version of the level really ever existed, or if this was always the way it had been. And the game you really remember was just in your head. The days of the personalization AI lording over players in Super Mario 64 is, if it ever existed, virtually dead, as PC emulation offers a much cheaper, more accessible alternative to buying a decades old console with the game and peripherals to go with it. We know this because data miners have poured over every inch of the game's files since the huge Nintendo leak recently and found nothing in the way of personalization of any kind. Though they did find Luigi, which I consider to be the biggest one of them all. Anyways, the earliest emulators predated this leak by many years though. So how were the original N64 emulators made if they needed the source code to emulate the software? As it turns out, the most recent leak was not the only one offering source code material apparently. All the way back in 1999, even before the turn of the new millennium, an employee from Silicon Graphics was said to have released a bombshell of a leak, the Oman Archive. This archive supposedly contained the treasure trove of documents related to the N64's development, from planning documents, to hardware schematics, to straight up code for the software. It was a feast for indie gamers who took to building emulation software for the Nintendo 64 on top of the leaked source code which ultimately allowed players from all walks of life to enjoy Super Mario 64 if only they had a basic PC and some know-how. You may have noticed, the employee came from a company called Silicon Graphics. Yes, that's THE Silicon Graphics we talked about earlier, the one I told you to remember. That's because Silicon Graphics, aka SGI, worked closely with Nintendo on the N64, providing the advanced hardware and software components that they believed they needed for the console to work. After SGI had convinced Nintendo to use their products, the collaboration team launched Project Reality. It was supposed to be an innovative, stunning new take on video games developed on literal supercomputers using bleeding edge programs. Did Project Reality succeed though? Well that's for you to decide. Project Reality eventually turned into the Nintendo 64. Middle Mario's textures? A Silicon Graphics design. The menu screen after booting up the game? A Silicon Graphics design. One observant commenter once said something that'll stick with me forever. The leaks have proved that Super Mario 64 is basically the world's best-selling Silicon Graphics demo. So you think, with all the success for the N64 and games like Mario 64, the SGI would be kinda set, right? Well, in 2009, the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and faded away into corporate acquisition obscurity. To many, this is the curse of Silicon Graphics faded to create one of the most enduring gaming experiences of all time, only to succumb itself not long after. If the personalization AI was ever real, as so many people have claimed, then perhaps it was the technology's initial developer, Silicon Graphics, that left the curse on Mario.
So why don't we see any of this in the massive leak that occurred in 2020? Or the Oman Archive? Some say it's because Nintendo had the leak censored somehow. The actual answer is that there never was any personalization AI or spooky anomalies or anything like that at all. It was just never possible to do, realistically. But that doesn't ruin the game. One can still imagine, with a dash of childlike wonder, just what sort of new and unexpected experiences this magical game still holds for us. And that covers the fourth layer of the Super Mario 64 Iceberg. We've reached the point where the secrets of the iceberg have become somewhat sinister, and we must remember that not everything listed on this graphic is necessarily real. Always do your own research. In our last video, we explored the waters of the iceberg of Mario 64, and now we have surmounted the iceberg's underwater summit. All that's left before us now on this journey is the dark, unsettling chasm of the abyss stretching out below. In the next video, we'll be investigating some truly bizarre mysteries, from shared nightmares plaguing young players of the game, all the way to a time rift's temporal ripples erasing the coveted sequel to Super Mario 64. All of that and much more lurking in the icebergs, absolute darkest layer. If you want to dive deeper into the Super Mario 64 iceberg and hear more about corporate curses, shared game nightmares, and so, so much more, then check out part 4 linked here now on the end screen. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a quick like and subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you for watching. Have a good one.